Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the final uh, part of the plant ones, and I just have to warn you that while it's a relatively short lecture, there's a lot of vocabulary, so please make sure that you're taking notes and keeping it straight. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, the sexual reproduction of, of plants right now. Remember that the multicellular haploid gametophyte generation alternates with the diploid sporophyte generation. The sporophyte is the recognize, recognizable plant that produces haploid spores by meiosis in sporangia, and that's for all plants, ferns, and above. Spores undergo mitotic division and develop into a multicellular male or female gametophyte. The gametophyte produces gametes by mitosis, and gametes fuse in a process called fertilization to form a zygote. In angiosperms, the sporophyte is the dominant stage. Gametophyte stages are reduced and totally dependent on the sporophyte and are attached to the sporophyte itself. Flowers are the reproductive structures of angiosperms and they hold the gametophyte stage. It has four sets of modified leaves. The sepals, which are often green to protect the flower. The petals, that often have bright colors. The stamens, which are the male gametophytes that develop in stamen sporangia as pollen grains, and the carpels, which are the female gametophytes that develop in carpal sporangia as embryo sacs in the base of the carpel. Pollination occurs when pollen lands on the stigma at the top of the carpel. The pollen tube grows from the grain into the embryo sac, and sperm is discharged and fertilizes the eggs. The zygote, which is the fertilized egg, develops into the embryo and the surrounding ovule develops into a seed. The entire ovary then develops into a fruit which contains one or more seeds. Seeds are dispersed when fruits are moved by wind or animals. There's a couple of different terms you need to know about flowers. Complete flowers are flowers with sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. They have to have all of those in order to be complete. An incomplete flower is missing one or more of the above. So a perfect flower contains both stamens and carpels. An imperfect flower is a unisexed flower. In other words, it's male or female. Monoecious plants are those plants that only produce one type of flower per plant. Dioecious plants produce both types of flowers on one plant. Pollen grains develop in the anthers of the stamens. Pollen has durable outer coatings that are able to withstand inhospitable conditions and prevent drying out. The formation of pollen follows these steps. In sporangial chambers of the anther, diploid microsporocytes undergo meiosis, producing four haploid cells. And you can see that happening in A. Haploid microspores undergo mitotic division to make generative cells and tube cells. You can see that in B. The wall of the microspore then thickens, and then the two cells surrounded by a thick wall become the pollen grain, and you can see that as E. In ovule development, it's a little bit different. The ovule forms in the plant ovary and contains the female sporangium. The female gametophyte is the embryo sac, so don't get those two confused. Within the embryo sac are contained the egg cell, which is located at one end and is flanked by two synergids. At the opposite end is the three antipodal cells. The other two nuclei in the center share the cytoplasm of large central cells called the polar nuclei, and the micropyle opening is the opening through which the integuments surrounding the embryo sac, and that's where the pollen tube goes through. Pollination is the placement of pollen on the stigma of the carpal, and pollen can be dispersed by wind and animals, both vertebrates and invertebrates, and perfect flowers can also self-pollinate, but most are cross-pollinated. Most monoecious angiosperms have a mechanism to prevent self-pollination, which helps to increase the genetic diversity of the species. 
Stamens and carpels often mature at different times in some species. Structural arrangements of the flower also can prevent self-transfer of pollen, like you see here where the carpel is much, much higher than the anthers. And some species are self-incompatible, which means that a biochemical event prevents self-fertilization. The union of these two sperm cells with the two cells of the embryo sacs is called double fertilization. On the stigma, the pollen grain germinates and extends a tube between the cells of the style toward the ovary. The generative cell divides to form two sperm. Following a chemical attractant, the tip of the pollen tube enters the micropyle and loosens the two sperm nuclei into the embryo sac. One sperm unites with the egg to form a zygote. The other sperm combines with the polar nuclei to produce a 3N or triploid endosperm. The ovule then develops into a seed and the ovary develops into a fruit. The endosperm is what feeds the, the embryo. So following pollination and fertilization, two major developmental steps occur in the life cycle of flowering plants, which do not occur in the mosses or ferns. One is the development of the seed, and the other is the development of the fruit. The seed development consists of conversion of the integument of the ovule into a resistant seed coat, the development of the endosperm, and the development of the embryo. The developing embryo grows, absorbs the endosperm, and stores those nutrients in seed leaves called cotyledons. All of these events take place within the original ovary. Now, I want you to think about that a little bit. So endosperm, like when we eat corn, the part we're eating is the endosperm, which is designed to feed the baby plant. So the little white part at the very base of the corn kernel is actually the embryo. Fruit development begins to develop after pollination and usually develops from the ovary, but sometimes other parts of the flower are involved. The cells of the ovary wall expand and the whole ovary enlarges to make room for the developing seeds. The extent of this enlargement and the final differentiation of the cells depends on the type of fruit. Large fleshy fruits develop a water-resistant outer layer and several inner layers of, um, I'm sorry, of large water storage cells, and these fruits are designed for enhancing seed dispersal by animals that eat the fruits and the seeds inside them. So basically, it's designed to get the seeds away from the parent plant. So these seeds can't be digested, and so the animals spread them within their feces. There are even certain seeds that are so adapted to this system that they literally cannot germinate until they have passed through the gut of an animal. These fruits, if they are not eaten, may also provide some heterotrophic nourishment to the germinating seeds. In contrast, dry fruits provide a covering for the seeds which will prevent desiccation, like in beans, for example. Some fruits are also designed to open violently and disperse the seeds. Others, such as those of the maple trees, are light and have expanded wing-like structures which aid in wind dispersal. So to remind you, a fruit is a mature ovary with seeds or ovules inside. It may or may not have a modified floral structures incorporated into it. Fruits have evolved to take advantage of air currents, water currents, and animals for dispersal of their seeds, and they function in seed protection. Dispersal strategies and forms include wings, hooks, hairs, sticky surfaces, and incorporation in animal digestive tracts. So enough on plant reproduction, now we're going to go into plant responses, because plants do respond to their environment just like all living organisms do. Tropisms are the responses by plants to the external environment. They can be positive, which means they turn toward the stimulus, or they can be negative, which means they turn away from the stimulus. Plants can't move away from a stimulus, but they can change their growth response. So basically, they grow in a direction or another. As a result, plant bodies are more flexible in morphology, in other words, in their structure, than those of animals. Some types of tropisms include phototropism. Cells on the dark side elongate faster than the cells on the light side of the plant. 
the uneven growth rate causes the bending of the stem toward the light, so it tilts the leaves toward the light source for more efficient photosynthesis. Gravitropism is another one, and that's the response to gravity. And different parts of the plants are differently responsive to gravitropism. So roots are positively gravitropic, and stems are negatively gravitropic. There's also one called thigmotropism, and it's also referred to as nastic movement, and that is response to touch. Certain plants will close their leaves to protect their softer parts when they're touched, and that protects them from being eaten, for example, by grasshoppers. It'll fold up, and basically the grasshopper falls right off. All of these tropisms and other things that go on inside the plant deal with plant hormones. Hormones are chemical signals produced in one location, transported, and has an effect in another location within the body of an organism. Phototropism is caused by a plant hormone, for example, gibberellin. Plant hormones are produced in extremely small quantities, but the effects may reflect balance between several hormones. I'm going to give you an example of four different plant hormones, and you need to know which one does what. Auxins are used in primary growth. Gibberellins are used in cell elongation and in tropism responses. Abscisic acids are used to tell the leaves to drop off. And ethylene is a gas that is used in fruit ripening. And that's why they always say one spoiled apple ruins the bunch. Okay. So, like I said, there was a lot of vocabulary during this lecture, and I know it was a little hard to keep up with, so make sure that you've taken really, really good notes. And if you have questions, of course, see me during office hours. And next time, we will start working on the animal kingdom. Have a great day.